Atoka sandstone outcropped on what they call rocky crest north of the sort of saddle, the firing area, the shale barrens. Uh, the trail runs right uh, along through there. This is interesting also. Kessler is the watershed divide between the Illinois River watershed and the White River watershed. If you were standing right here and it rained, it was raining, the water that hit on this side would go to the White River and the water that fell right here would go to the Illinois River. So that's kind of the neat thing about Kessler. Here's the famous Kessler limestone, a natural outcrop there along the Egg Beater Trail, I think it is, uh, up there. And this is where it was described from. Perhaps the most interesting, or at least the rarest community on Kessler Mountain are the Shale Barrens. And this was very poorly known, still is. Only a few examples were known until we did the Glade map. And um, these are extremely dry in the summer. They're an open savanna community dominated by post oak and blackjack oak and chinkapin oak. Not Cozart chinkapin, but chinkapin oak, which likes a high pH soil. Um, these trees here, some of the older gnarliest trees up there, Dr. Staley at the U of A and his colleagues at Cordon about 250 years old. So this is an old growth uh, woodland community up there. And with a very much prairie glade grassland understory. Uh, really old, neat trees up there. Hard life for sure. Very thin soil, it's shale right there on the ground. And this is little blue stem, our dry prairie grass is the dominant in here. Um, this is cream false indigo, Baptisia, uh, Bracteata, another dry woodland species like goldenrods, asters, high diversity up here. Uh, little blue stem again dominating the openings. Old trees really exposed. It's an erosional uh, community. It was probably heavily grazed a long time ago, which exacerbated that erosion. You can see that. The lower part of this tree, the roots and everything are exposed. But it's still, uh, there's no little invasive species there. It's all native dry prairie blade plants. Ancient community. Uh, we started uh, cluing in about this interesting community and wanted to find more. So we uh, started at the Glade map and uh, we're looking for these from aerial infrared imagery. And this is just off Kessler Mountain. We find several other examples. Never been visited by any ecologist or botanist, to anyone's knowledge. Could have all sorts of rare things there. These are all around fate. Uh, we need to find out what's in these. This is undescribed territory. Nobody knows about them other than a little bit of Kessler and we've got two other sites that we've looked at. And in fact, this is the biggest one we know of. It's a great big uh, single barrens. It was all surrounded by prairie. It's on a conical knob called Pinnacle. This is down near Prairie Grove. And uh, no one's been on it. I just looked at it on the aerial photograph and uh, pretty excited about it. But look around it. This is all prairie. You can see those uh, pimple mounds all through there. The, wet, uh, the dark is wet, wetlands. Wet prairie, uh, historically probably all fescue now, but um, worth checking out. Most of Kessler Mountain is a singular community. Uh, we'll call dry oak wood, and it's a fire dependent community. All these grasslands burned a lot. The prairies were maintained by fire in these valleys. The fire did not stop at the edge of the prairie, but would have burned up these slopes. And uh, the the native flora that are that can live in these on the ground in these dry oak woodlands depends on sunlight. There are no shade tolerant uh, native wildflowers and grasses really in the dry upland communities. Very few, I should say. Uh, not, not tolerant of deep shade. Deep shade, uh, native wildflowers and grasses need moisture. They grow on lower north slopes. They grow along riparian corridors, along creeks. And what happens when the forest canopy gets really dense in the mid-story shrub layer gets really dense in these open oak woods is you get this sort of a ground cover, which is to say nothing. There's no plants on the ground hardly, very few. The plants you do find on the ground are woody plants like these hickory seedlings, these ash seedlings, there's a little oak seedling, a couple of little shade suppressed woodland grasses. But you get nothing flowering. 
there should be wildflowers and grasses and things in these woods, but you don't get any of that. You just get these things sitting there waiting for a tree to fall so they can grow. And um, there's no nectar resource from flowers for invertebrates. There's no seeds or fruit being produced for uh, other wildlife. And what you do get is a lot of poison ivy, and you also get dense leaf litter. This can be six inches deep, accumulated over decades. It's slow to break down in these dry systems. It's mostly uh, slow to decay, post oak leaves and so on. And um, you think about you mulch your garden, right? To keep weeds out, to keep plants from growing up through the shrubs you planted or whatever. That's what's happening here. The entire landscape has been mulched in the absence of fire. And we've seen a drastic loss of biological diversity in our upland communities. And there's some exceptions, which I'll talk about. Then you'll find, right next to that, there's a power line corridor on this. You go in that power line corridor, and you'll walk down there, and you'll, it won't be long before you're at 100 species of plants. All sun-loving, prairie-type stuff, wildflowers. This is all uh, big blue stem, which is one of the big prairie grasses right in the foreground. All little blue stem through here. 15 other grasses. All mm -hmm. kinds of asters and goldenrods and stuff. And that didn't come in there because they bulldozed a power line through there. That stuff that was there and it's the only place left that it has enough sunlight. And you can see some asters here blooming in September, October, again with the little blue stem. There's also clues in the surrounding wood. This plant right here is called pale Indian plantain. It is a prairie plant. It likes a dry to somewhat moist prairie. It needs full sun or, or largely, uh, most, mostly in the sun. And you'll find scrap, just a few hanging on here and there in the woods of Kessler. And none of them ever flower. There's not enough light in there for that flower. It takes a lot of energy, sends up a flower stalk six feet tall, and it won't do it uh, in that shade suppressed situation. Now, there are some areas on Kessler that are still a little more open in the woods. And these are right above the bluff lines, where there's a natural break in the canopy because of the bluff, right? So the bluff drops 60 feet or whatever it is, 50 feet, and then there's uh, light coming right in from the side, and you'll still get these sort of open grassy woods. And it's pretty neat because where you see that, you'll find much higher species diversity. There's also this particular spot, the old land survey uh, line went right through here. So that guy in 1830 walked through here, and this is what he said about this line on the survey. Poor and rocky, timber white, black, and post oak, undergrowth, oak, black locust, grassy woods, not fit for cultivation. <laughs> so that's another clue, you know, it wasn't closed, it wasn't um, nothing on the ground. And there's some rare species of plants in these more open uh, woodlands that, that need sunlight. Uh, this is one of the coolest plants that I found in the, in the inventory. It's tracked as a species of conservation concern by the Natural Heritage Program. So whenever we find it, we get excited and take data about it and put it in the database. It's called prairie rattlesnake root. This is what it looks like when it flowers. Unfortunately, this photo was taken not at Kessler, it was down in Prairie. On Kessler, this is all you get. So uh, in, the, in the absence of sunlight, it makes a slow-growing colony, and the leaves, you only get the basal leaves. It takes a lot of energy to flower. It has a little tuber on it, like a little potato-like thing. And it takes a lot of energy it has to, in order to flower. It sends up that flower stalk. It has to gather a lot of energy. It's not getting it in these shade-suppressed woodlands. And we've seen this all over uh, our natural areas where we, we have this plant. Once we start burning and thinning the woods, up it comes, starts flowering all over the place. But it's a really rare species of grasslands in Arkansas. Uh, another one is the prairie white trout lily. And uh, that's another one that likes dry you may know the other white trout lily that likes some streamside, really rich forest. This is a drought, uh, it's really a prairie thing. It likes open, dry woodlands. The flowers um, are a little bit different. It makes a tight clump and not a uh, big colony. These little tight clumps. The leaves are folded in half uh, as they emerge up. And then the fruit lays over on the ground, whereas the other white trout lily holds it up in the air. Um, Another really rare uh, plant there is something called Eastern Yampa. This is another, it's really a savanna species, open, open woodlands. And it's found in several places in there. It's in the carrot family. Uh, really neat, feathery, dissected leaf. 
And it's known from just a handful of places in Arkansas. There's quite a population on Kessler Mountain, mostly on the ridge top wood, woodlands. And then, you've met many of you probably heard of this uh, plant. This is the Missouri ground cherry. Uh, it actually occurs more on the bluffs. And uh, I think it got out of place in the slideshow. But I'll go ahead and talk about it. It is. Um, it was known only in Arkansas from old historic records. There was no recent records of this plant. I think the last record was from the 1950s. And I've been looking for it for years and never found it, but there was a specimen in the herbarium from Kessler Mountain. And did you find any yellow wood up there on the bluff? I did find yellow wood, yes sir. Uh -huh. It was on the, the limestone bluffs on the side, on the east side, where it was very mesic and dense forest down in there. I'll talk about that habitat in a minute. So there were several significant areas uh, that were identified, and I'll talk about those. A couple of my slides somehow got put out of order. Um, there were, not everything was open wood. There are dense, naturally closed mesic forests. Mesic means moderately moist. It's not wet, but it's rich and lush, uh, not real dry, not a fiery, not a burning kind of a place. And this occurs naturally on Kessler, especially at the highest elevations and right sort of uh, below the bluffs and in the steepest topography. Uh, it is very different than these dry woodlands. The plants you find here are shade adapted. They like closed canopy, moist conditions. There are a lot of spring ephemeral wildflowers, um, big stands of things like green violet, which is pretty neat to see. Uh, it's huge along one of the trails, the Spellbound Trail. It's just off the preserve. Things like Jack in the Pulpit, at high elevation on Kessler, Dutchman's Bridges. These are spring ephemeral wildflowers that, that do most of their growing when the leaves are off the trees. It's a closed canopy forest, so it's very shaded during the growing season when the leaves are out. But in the early spring, there's no leaves on these oaks, and sunlight's coming in, and all these spring ephemerals are growing. That's how you know you have a natural closed canopy forest versus these dry woodlands that I talked about before. The plants that are there can handle that shade in the groves. You have species in the canopy like um, shag bark hickory, aptly named. And this is a great plant. It's uh, real important for bats. A lot of our bat species will roost under these big exfoliating plates of bark. And I bet if there's ever a bat study done on Kessler, it would find some really interesting stuff between all the bluff cracks and, and cave shelters and, and these things would be neat. And then, uh, unfortunately, a lot of the mesic forest below the bluffs got really beat up in an ice storm. I guess it was in 2009, was that the, yeah. the last big one? Yeah, okay, so the canopy's real busted up. And after the canopy got all busted up, you know, historically, before we had non-native invasive plants on the landscape, all the, there'd be a whole suite of natives that would have flourished for a few years until the canopy closed back. But what's happened at Kessler is a couple of pretty bad actors have really invaded, like bush honeysuckle, and I'll talk more about those in a minute, but they really took advantage of, they love a mesic forest, and they went nuts in these areas where the canopy got busted up by the ice and wind. Uh, there's some really cool plants associated with the limestone outcrops, like this, this is a pretty rare species called Baldwin's Climbing Milkweed. Everybody knows about our milkweeds of the prairies and the butterfly wheat and all that. But we have another set that are vines, and this is one of the rarest ones we have. Its main center of its range is in the Ozarks. And uh, it, it's on Kessler at several, several sites. Beautiful plant. Um, on these broken ledges around these bluffs, you start to get some really nice, look like little gardens hanging out up there. This is where you're getting some sunlight in. You get things like earnest spiderwort and big clumps. There are a couple other sort of mesic habitats. Uh, and they're along these riparian zones, these creekside areas. This is the stream that comes off the east side of the mountain. And now where it enters into, enters into the regional park, the Watershed Conservation Resource Center I know is doing some restoration. Uh, the stream on, on the reserve is in really good shape. Once it got out into those fields now where the park is, it was badly entrenched and pretty degraded, but they're working on some restoration. These are the ephemeral creeks on the west side of the mountain. They were dry even in, I mean, I think they only run after a rain. Uh, they, were, they were dry even in the, in the summer. Uh, and then there's the bluffs. The bluffs are really probably the second most interesting uh, plant community on Kessler Mountain. And bluffs have different communities on them depending on whether 
are not there, acidic or calcareous, and totally different flora. And they have different um, flora based on whether they are, what direction they face. So if you have bluffs that face south or west, they're oftentimes very dry. If you have bluffs that face north or east, they're oftentimes messy or more moist. And then if you have one with a dripping groundwater component, it's a whole other community. So bluffs are very diverse, and they have really high species diversity. And that's including the talus layer, the loose rock below the bluff that's fallen over, off of it over millennia, and also the rim rock above the bluff line. So if you take those two communities and the bluff all three together, you get this incredible species richness. Bluffs are also ecologically really interesting. I call them the, the great catcher's mitt of all the, the habitats in Arkansas. And what I mean by that is as species of plants have moved across the landscape over ecological time with changes in climate, they've oftentimes found refugia in these bluff communities. So we have a lot of weird western species, southwestern species too, that are on west-facing and south-facing bluffs. And that flora that they belong to is a thousand miles from here, hundreds of miles west. But at one time in the past, that flora was here. And it's hung on in those places. And likewise, our rich north-facing bluffs have this northern flora that has come down. You know, glaciers were at St. Louis 100,000 years ago. Everything north of there was under ice. All that flora that they have up there today was down here. It's since gone back up there, but it's hung out and been stranded on a few places here. And that's what makes the bluffs so fascinating. Uh, the bluffs are diverse. They have um, some big, sort of massive rock bluffs on Kessler. And there's some with a lot of cracks and crevices in them. I keep showing that. There's a, there's a button that like takes you back to the home screen. So I keep getting. Um, well, what's there, his name? There's uh, overhangs, a lot of ledges and overhangs, and they provide little flat spots in the shaded areas underneath. So they have their own flora, and a great habitat for all sorts of wildlife. Um, if you've ever surveyed bluff lines, you sort of dread. You know it's come. You know you're going to find one, and you hate to do it. But you'll start startle black vultures. They they hang out in these crevices, and. They're, they're nasty, and they hiss at you, they'll burst out of there all of a sudden, and they supposedly can vomit up some caustic stuff on you, so I'm real wary of them. And Mike Slade, who was a guy in, in uh, this picture here, this is my friend Mike Slade, he works, he's a karst ecologist for Nature Conservancy, and he and I, I got him to help me survey the bluffs, we're looking for groundwater cave, or caves and groundwater seeps, and uh, we flushed about three or four one day, and it was, uh, it was memorable. Um, there's also these things I call hallways. There's areas where the rocks have calved off the bluff face in huge house-sized boulders. And there's these little hallways in there. And they have some interesting things in those. Uh, the, the good example of that, the best example of that is at Rock City. There's all sorts of these little hallways and crevices between the rocks. And there's some rare plants that I'll get to in a second. Uh, and then on the, a couple of places, we found some significant what we call rock houses, bluff shelters, big overhangs, uh, deep ones. And uh, there's some neat ones that had uh, a number of uh, deep pockets back in, little caves that went off into the bluff out of the back of the rock house. And there are pack rats nesting in there and all sorts of things. And this is looking out from one of the deeper ones, kind of a little cave back in there. Bluffs are real important for fern species. There's a lot of different ferns uh, at Kessler on the bluffs. Uh, here's a few examples. On the limestone rocks that are moist, you get walking fern. The walking fern gets its name because it walks across the rock. The frond comes out and the tip of it is a long skinny tip and roots in the moss, starts a new plant, and over time walks across the rock. There's a bunch of different spleen warts in the genus Asplenium. There's maidenhair. There's black stem, or ebony. There's that snake again. There's uh, this other uh, black stem spleen where that's what I was looking for. There's purple cliff break on high pH rocks, Alabama lip fern on high pH rocks. Uh, and then on the more mesic, shaded, moist bluffs, you get a whole different group of ferns. You get, uh, uh, well, actually this one's on some dry ones too. The one on the on the left is Blunt Low Cliff Fern, and then Tennessee Bladder Fern is on the really kind of moist mesic bluffs. 
And the bluffs are, are widespread. I've mapped the significant bluffs here on the left in, in blue. You can see they sort of skirt along both sides of the mountain. The pink is the trails. Yeah. Before you leave bluffs yeah. and with this map up there, as, as FNHA and, and partners are working toward working with the city on a habitat management plan, uh, the bluffs are a real popular feature in areas that are open to public access. You know, for a lot of reasons, they're they're just attractive and nice to be around. But what, do you have any specific like out of this report as far as you know? It is an it, it's a significant area with a significant amount of plant diversity. It's really important for wildlife shelter, mm -hmm. and you were kind of alluding to a little bit for mammals and and beyond. But um, I don't know. I don't know how vulnerable you feel like these bluffs are at the moment. They can be. Yeah, I mean. Um if there's rock climbing going on, it's good to like have a designated area and just say you guys got to stay and rock climb here. I don't know if rock climbing is something you're looking at, but um, and then you know overlooks and things like that. You want to just be careful where you put them. And I don't know. Yeah, they're they don't lend themselves to a lot of other uses really other than rock climbing. I mean, uh, it's scenic sort of things, but um, we have problems with pot hunters. People that dig in the bluff shelters, they're tearing us up in several of our areas repeatedly, over all the time. They're in there digging up pots and arrowheads and whatever else. I don't know. Okay. That's the main thing. Yeah. Uh, this is the rarest fern out there on these bluffs at Kessler, and I was surprised to see it. It's a little further south than any of the other known sites. This is at Rock City. The plant is called the powdery cloak fern. It is a western species, its main range. Is in the Edwards Plateau of Texas. It comes up through the dry limestone country of Kansas and Oklahoma, and then jumps to the Ozarks on Dolomite and limestone bluffs. And there it is, Kessler. It gets the name powdery cloak fern because the undersurface of the frond has a talcum-like powder, and you can rub it off. It's not the spores; it's something separate. Really interesting. It's covered in this powder. And that's the name powdery cloak for and this is what you know it's really white at some times of the year uh, it is a dry desert fern and i'm always fascinated that it can grow in a pit in the rock no soil at all and the really dry bluffs there's no moisture dripping out and how they make it is beyond me another rare species uh, this was a new to science in 2006 it was unknown completely new species to science called church's wild rye so it's, it's a rye grass it's similar to bottle brush wild rye, which you may know, but it has these extremely curved awns. It grows in, in nodding heads. It grows in dry uh, bluff line type habitat. And it was described as a new species from Penny Jean Mountain, which is kind of neat. And here it was. This is the first record from up around here. Uh, it was in several places. The ledges and the talus uh, along, I mentioned that, are important. And the talus, which is the loose rock below the bluff face, uh, is the habitat for the Missouri ground cherry, which is a species that hadn't been seen for 60 years in Arkansas or something like that. And it was found at, I think, five sites on Kessler. Just a few plants in every site. It's an annual species, so it uh, does its whole life cycle in a year. And you can see the annual taproot. It doesn't have a fiber, uh, an underground perennial root system. It has these little hanging, papery, uh, Chinese lantern-like fruits. and. Uh, it grows with a very common species, and they actually grow right together. And it was neat to find them together because I got to do a little comparison. The rare one, the Missouri ground cherry, has a solid yellow flower, kind of a bright yellow. The uh, downy ground cherry has a more flared, pale, pale yellow flower with five purple dots in it. The stamens are yellow on the Missouri, and they're blue on the downy. But I mean, they. If you, you know, you might just casually glance at it and think it was all the same thing. The fruit shape, however, is quite different. Uh, the Missouri is uh, sort of squat and long and pointed on the downy. In cross section, there's 10 ribs on the Missouri and only five sort of star shape in cross section on the downy. And the fruit are different sizes and different shapes. So pretty neat stuff. So again, this is like the Chinese lanterns there in a papery husk. A tomatillo is in this genus. This looks like a tomatillo. Uh, but it's small. Um, same genes. There are some wetlands on Kessler, and because it's all elevated and, and steep, there's uh, not, you know, it's mostly groundwater type 
seepage in springs. And there's several different uh, areas there. We found some significant groundwater, uh, mucky soil, wetland plants, um, some rare, well, uncommon sedges and things associated with these, and some pretty good muck. And muck is something that Mike Slay really loves because he likes to dig around in there and find these rare um, groundwater cave dwelling amphipods and isopods. This is a cool one. This is geologic contact between two rock types on one of the bluffs. And right where they, so this is like got cracks and um, holes in, in it, and water moves through it. And this is a shale, and it just runs across the top. So right where the contact is, the water comes out. And uh, Mike digging around in there and he found some pretty cool stuff. Um, this is a spring uh, isopod. It grows in kind of a lot of above ground type springs. This, however, is a groundwater isopod. It lives its entire life underground and occasionally gets flushed out in these springs and that's where he found this one. And he wasn't sure of the species. There's some new ones being described. They're cave animals. Also found this neat little thing, a little amphipod, looks like a little shrimp. Uh, no eyes, completely white, no pigment. Mm -hmm. And these are groundwater species and they're, he said he wasn't sure what species they were yet. He's gonna do some work on it, but uh, whatever it is, it's, it's considered a conservation concern. So those are interesting. There's some salamanders associated with these seeps and springs. This is the Oklahoma salamander, um, which is fairly widespread in this area. Uh, this is a rare species that's tracked by the Heritage Program. The Ozark zigzag salamander is found in a couple of springs in there. And then there are some interesting plants. This is a little sedge called short sedge. It's a spring obligate thing. And then this uh, was a big surprise. This is the frosted mountain mint. See, it looks like the leaves have frost on them. Incredibly fragrant, intense peppermint-like uh, fragrance. And it's a species of wet grassland. It's like low prairies. Uh, Mesic prairies, and it wasn't even known from this part of the state. There was no records from Washington County. Um, I expect it was common in the low prairies all around Kessler Mountain.